Hi everyone. One topic I see some people struggling with is how to control the depth of their V-carves. Usually we'll see a picture of a V-carve operation that didn't quite come out the way the person intended. It either cut too shallow or too deep, or sometimes it cuts shallow in one area and deep in another. Usually this person will look for a depth setting like they can find on contour and pocketing operations. But V-carving works differently and there's no direct way to control the depth. In this video, I'm going to dive into that a little deeper and show you some tricks you can use to hopefully get the desired results. On the left, we have a traditional end mill. It has a fixed diameter, meaning that at any point along its cutting surface, the diameter is the same as every other point. This consistency of the cutting diameter means that we can move the end mill to any arbitrary depth in the wood and get the same result. A V-carving bit and a V-carving operation are fundamentally different. You can see that as the end mill plunges into the wood, the diameter changes. By plunging deeper, we can make a wider cut, and by plunging less, we can make a narrower cut. A V-carving operation therefore attempts to create the correct width of cut only at the surface of the wood, with the remainder of the bit plunging into the wood, creating the traditional V shape. This also means that the depth of a V-carving operation is contingent on the width of the cut, and that is why I say it is not directly controllable. Based on the geometry of the end mill, there is only one depth that will produce any given width of cut. On the left, you can see a diagram of a typical V-carving operation. In this case, you can see the outline of the letter to be carved, as well as the path the cutter will take down the center of the letter, including all the branches. Unlike profile and pocketing operations that can be done on either side of the line, a V-carve is always done down the center of the closed shape to be V-carved. Two red circles mark a specific location on the V-carve that we'll take a look at a little closer now. On the right, you can now see a bit hovering over an imaginary piece of wood. The two red dots on the right are meant to indicate that this is the same location as marked on the left. As Carbide Create is generating the G-code to move the bit for a V-carving operation, in the background it's determining what vertical location will cause the 60 degree V-bit to be buried far enough in the wood that at the surface the diameter of the cut is equal to the width of the letter. Hopefully on the right you can see how that works. Let's see how changing the bit angle changes the operation. I've added a 90 degree bit, but the red circles are the same distance apart. As I move the 90 degree bit down, you'll notice it doesn't have to plunge as deeply into the wood to produce the same result. Finally, I've added a 30 degree bit, and this time it's going to be even more interesting. As I move the 30 degree bit downward, the bit is actually not wide enough to even make this cut. While the cut can eventually be made in multiple passes, it's dangerously close to going all the way through our stop. For now, the important lesson here is to realize that for a given width, the steeper the angle of the bit, the deeper the cut. If you have a thin piece of stock, you may want to consider a 90 degree bit or possibly even wider so that the bit doesn't go as deep. If however you have very thin details, this works against you. A 90 degree bit may not bite very far into a thin detail, and depending on your stock, you may not even see the result on it. This is why there's no one best bit to use for any operation. Thinner details will generally look better with steeper angles such as 30 degrees, but if the stock is too thin to support it, you'll have to step up to a 60 or whatever bit is appropriate for the job. This is also a good place for us to explore some of the problems you might have when V-carving. Let's suppose your stock isn't even. This is fairly common, especially if you buy your wood from big box stores. So what happens when your stock isn't perfectly flat? This is something we actually see quite often, especially when people are doing fine detailed things such as stars. The red dots are all on a plane that we've zeroed. You can see that parts of the wood ride below that plane and other parts ride above it. But the Shapeoko has no way of knowing that. It simply does its math based on what you tell it 
the zero point is. As we move the V-bits down to contact the wood, we can see where problems might arise. On the left, the actual stock is lower than our zero point. This means that we're engaging a smaller diameter portion of the bit, so our details are going to be undersized. On the right, the stock is writing higher than our zero point. Because of this, we're engaging a wider portion of the bit, and our details are going to be spread out. This is also a common reason why the points of stars might be rounded over. The stock is thick enough that as the bit retracts, the wood is still contacting a wider portion of the bit instead of giving you a sharp point. This same information, when used intentionally, can actually be helpful. There's a technique sometimes called cheating the Z that can be used to kind of dial in the detail level of your carving. It can be particularly useful with very fine engravings. All it means is that you zero the bit slightly above the surface. When you run it, it will therefore not carve as deeply and the details will be smaller than they should be, but you may still produce the effect you want. If it doesn't, you simply return to your original Z, drop the bit ever so slightly, zero it at the new location, and then try it again. You simply repeat this until you've achieved the depth that you want. Now's where things get scary because we're about to do some math. While much of this won't be directly useful, I always find that understanding the math behind a process helps me understand it more fully. In front of you, we have a close-up of what we were looking at before. We have a 60 degree bit about to plunge into a V-carve operation where it's trying to achieve a certain width. To understand what V-carve or carbide create is doing in the background, first we're going to understand the V-bit as a triangle. And in fact, we're going to split it down the middle so that we can work with a right triangle. We already have some information here. I've marked an angle A, and A would simply be half of the stated angle of the bit. In this case, it's a 60 degree bit, so we have a 30 degree angle A. The second important piece of information we have is the width of our cut. In this case, one half an inch, which I've marked as X. It may have been a while for many of you, but you might remember the acronym SOKATOA. If you didn't use this mnemonic or if it's simply been too long, this is simply a shorthand to remember that sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. In this case, the opposite of angle A, which I've labeled as O, is analogous to the width of our cut. It's along the same axis and the adjacent side is analogous to our depth. I've marked it as side A. For people who are a little more visual, it may be worth thinking of the V bit as a series of smaller triangles. In this case, I'm attempting to locate the triangle within the bit where the width of the opposite side is equal to half the width of my cut, since I'm dealing with half the triangle. You can see that this line here lines up quite well. So I'm attempting to locate this triangle and determine what the adjacent side is, as this is how far down the bit we should have to ride in order to achieve this width. Simple. We start with the formula that the tangent of angle A is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. We can swap in the information we have, such as angle A being 30 degrees and our desired width being half of X, since we're only dealing with half the bit. We can rearrange the formula by multiplying both sides by A and then dividing both sides by the tangent of 30. And then we can make the calculator do the hard work. 0.25 divided by 30 tangent equals 0.43 inches. What that's telling me is that to achieve this cut, this bit has to ride 0.43 inches down into the wood. So when VCarve or Carbide Create is working things out, it simply looks at every point along this path to see what the desired cut width is, to work out mathematically how far down in the wood the bit has to ride to produce that width, and then it simply produces gradual changes between them as the bit moves through the cut. 
Again, this is not math you have to do to perform v-carving operations, but it does help you understand the process better. And I'm going to show you how we can use this in reverse to do one more cool trick. A common trick in CNCing in general is to do a finishing pass. This typically means you do your normal pass, but you leave a small amount of material, an amount very easy for the cutter to take off. And then once you've finished your normal passes, you do one more finishing pass that carves everything down to its final size. In some software, you can simply ask it to do this finishing operation for v-carving, but that feature is not in Carbide Create. But that doesn't mean we can't force it to do one. We know from earlier that a wider angle bit, such as a 90, would not go so deep into the wood. And essentially a finishing pass is that, it's a bit that doesn't go as deep into the wood. What if we lie to Carbide Create and tell it it's a 62 degree bit instead of a 60? We would then get tangent of 31 is equal to 0.25 inches over the length of A. When we open up calculator to make it do the hard work, now we get 0.41 inches. This would leave 0.02 inches for the finishing pass. By removing so much less material than its first pass, it'll leave a much smoother finish. The only consequence in Carbide Create is that you'll be asked to insert a different bit partway through the project. But it does mean you can perform a finishing operation just by understanding a little bit of the math behind v-carving. So what do we do with that 30 degree bit from earlier? You can see that as I bring the bit down into the wood, it already is poking through the bottom and it has not reached the desired width. Depending on your bit and your stock thickness, sometimes the software can get around this by taking multiple passes. First the bit will travel down one side and then the other, and it can continue downward until it reaches a peak at the bottom. But because the cutter is a fixed angle, it can only ever continue down at that angle. So unless we have stock thick enough to support the width of the cut, it's never going to work. Vetrix VCAR software and their other family of products have a feature called flat bottom depth. Carbide Create lacks this feature, but that doesn't mean we can't manipulate it into doing what we want anyways. In a flat bottom depth V-carve cut, the cutter is set to go to a fixed depth. The bit is used to carve one side and then the other and then the material in between can be carved out using a traditional end mill. This gives angled sides, which still maintain most of the look and the aesthetic of a v-carve, without requiring an excessive depth. The easiest way to do this is to run the cutter at a fixed depth. In order to do that, first we need to know how far from our line to carve. In the last step, we knew the diameter of the bit and we were calculating the depth. In this case, we know the depth and we're seeking to calculate the associated diameter. We start once again with the angle being half of the stated angle. This time it's a 30 degree bit, so we'll want to make sure we use 15 degrees. We're going to use the same tangent function. Tangent of the angle is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. In this case, our angle is 15, and I've chosen a flat bottom depth of 0.25 inches. This means the distance from the top of the stock to where the tip of our end mill is will be one quarter of an inch. In this case, we want to solve for our opposite side, simply by multiplying both sides by 0.25, resulting in our opposite side equaling the tangent of 15 degrees times 0.25. Once again, relying on calculator, 15 tangent times 0.25 or 0.067 inches. This means if we move the v-bit 0.067 inches away from our actual profile line and cut to a depth of 0.25 inches, that the edge of it should cut right on our line. Once you've calculated this distance, you can simply use the Carbide Create Offset tool to create an offset of your geometry equal to 0.067 inches and run your v-bit as a profile operation on that line. Your second toolpath would use a suitable square end mill to cut an interior pocket on that offset geometry. That will take care of carving out the material between the points that the v-carving leaves. 
If you've stayed with me this far, I appreciate it. I genuinely believe that understanding the math behind how these operations are done can only open doors that allow you to do more with your machine or make it do things that it might not otherwise want to do. That said, I don't expect you to break out trigonometry functions anytime you want to put some of this knowledge to use. I'll leave a link down in the description, but I've been setting up a website in the background, and while I don't have much on there yet, I have created two calculators for use by the community. The calculator on the left, if given a bit angle, and the cut width, will tell you the depth of the cut. It'll tell you how deep your V-carve will go. If that's more than your stock, then you know you have to adjust something. Likewise, if you want to do a V-carve operation with a flat bottom in Carbide Create, telling the second calculator the angle of your bit and how deep you want it to go will tell you the offset from your geometry you need your cutter to cut at so that the edge of your V-bit will be on your line. If you have any trouble using these tools, please let me know. And if there's any tools that you think would be useful to have built into a website, likewise, leave me a comment. I do website development as my day job, so uh, if it would be useful for people, then I would be happy to contribute that way. Thank you for watching, and as always, I hope you found something useful in this video. If you did, it really helps me out when you leave a thumbs up or even subscribe. I'm closing in on 500 subscribers as of when I'm making this video, and it's really exciting. I appreciate everyone who's taken the time to leave me feedback and a comment, and I hope you enjoy the videos I have to come.